Ugia is a fourth year PhD student in the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford in the Operations Research Group, where she's advised by Aaron Sidford. Ugia is broadly interested in optimization problems, sometimes at the intersection of machine learning theory and graph applications, and she's worked a lot on the theoretical groundings of some of these important algorithms. So we're really excited to hear from her today on the sample complexity for average war with my Markov decision processes. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Yujia. It's a great honor to be able to present here. And today I'm going to talk about the sample complexity for average reward Markov decision processes. So this is based on a sequence of joint works with Aaron Sitford, and that has been published in ICML 2020 and 2021. So the problem we are going to look at is this basic model of Markov decision process. It is a classical mathematical tool that models uncertainty. So I'm very sure everyone here is very familiar with this basic model in RL. So it just means that given a state, an agent can take different actions that might lead to different transitions and different rewards for each step. So there are many real world applications that can be uh, captured by this uh, very simple model. For example, the game playing or in particular playing chess can be modeled by uh, this Markov decision process. And also autonomous driving and chip design in industry can also be modeled by this uh, very simple and powerful mathematical tool. And also, we also have inventory control in revenue management, which can also recently be modified by this because every time you can consider your inventory as the current state and you can make a decision about how many more inventory you are going to get and observe the uncertainty of the environment, which is the demand of the customers. So there are many applications of Markov decision process and the mathematical uh, concrete model of this are composed of these four elements. So first of all, we have the state space. So here in this toy example, I'm using A and B to denote the state. And also for each state, it has the action space where I'm using the blue lines and the red lines. So for uh, state A, it might have two actions. And for state B, it also has two actions in this toy example. And also different actions might lead to different probability transitions. So here I'm considering a deterministic transition in particular. So action one has probability one staying at the original state and action two of state A has one probability one trans, uh, going to state B. And similarly for a, a state B, it has same two action transitions. And next, we have the reward that each agent can collect while taking, depending on the state action and the next state it transits to. So here I'm considering a very simple reward that only depends on the state it transits to. So the reward equals to zero when A is staying at itself and equals to one when it is transiting to B. And similarly, these are the rewards for uh, agent as state B. So this is a very simple example uh, to talk about all the elements in a Markov decision process. And in the study of Markov decision process, what we are usually want to know is the policy of it. So a policy of an agent essentially means what action an agent wants to take at each state and time step. Mathematically, it is a mapping from the state space to the action space. There are different notions of policy one can think of for studying Markov decision process. And also it can vary depending on the model you're considering. So the stationary policy essentially means that the uh, decision you are going to make only depends on the current state. It can be further classified into deterministic policy and randomized policy. So the deterministic policy is a mapping between state to only pure action space. And the randomized policy is a mapping between state space to the simplex over the action space. So there's also non-stationary policy that one might consider and are usually considered in finite horizon settings where the action can depend on the state space and also the time step T. So these are the uh, different policies that one may consider for MDP. And it is well established that because of the Markovian structure of MDP, which means that the next state and transitions only depend on the current state, so it suffices to actually consider stationary policy for the MDP uh, where you don't need to vary the action you take depending on the time step and only needs to allow it to depend on the state space. 
So this is also the class of policies that we will focus on throughout our study. So how do we measure the quality of a policy for markup decision process? We usually look at the cumulative reward that can be different, defined differently for the different model. So under a policy pie, let's say for this toy example, our very simple policy is just that the agent will always play action one as state A and play action two as state B. So this is the induced Markov chain of this model. And you can see that if we start from B, it will go directly to A and stay at A forever. So in the discounted MDP model, which is also the most well-studied model, the cumulative reward is known as the infinite series of the uh, discounted reward that is connected throughout the time steps. So we need to discount the reward to the, power, uh, to the factor of gamma to the t at the t's time step in future. So in this particular example, suppose we're starting from B, then the cumulative reward we collect for the discounted MDP equals to 2, uh, depending on the reward that we have defined. And also, for the average reward MDP, which is a different model, the pe what people usually care about is the average uh, reward that you are going to connect through the first t time steps and taking the limit of this <clears throat> average uh, quantity. So we do not do the discounting here and only consider <clears throat> the average reward we are going to receive. So in this particular example, the value, average value of this reward is going to be zero. So as you can see, <clears throat> even if we are considering a same probability transition, the discounted MDP and the average reward MDP can have very different cumulative reward because of their definition. So in this study, we will focus on the latter case, the average reward MDP, which will have a lot of applications when you don't want to uh, reduce the effect of future events, but also this is the model that has been less understood in the literature. Okay, so this is the setting of our problem. <clears throat> and next, <clears throat> we are going to make this key assumption about bounded mixing time. So the bounded mixing time says that under any stationary deterministic and randomized policy pi, the induced Markov chain of the game will mix in t mixed time steps. So mathematically, this means that the probability transition matrix P under the policy pi, which we denote by P pi, raising it to the t mixed power, then every row of it will essentially look like a stationary distribution row pi. So this is the mathematical formula of it. Why is this good? This is a standard uh, assumption that has been made in previous work on average reward MDP. Also, this is a nice assumption because it ensures that the value under a, uh, under a policy pi is well defined regardless of the initial state. So for any initial distribution we start from, after uh, running long enough times, the probability transition matrix will always look at the will always make it look like the stationary distribution with the same stationary distribution. So this means that regardless of the initial distribution, in the end, the average reward we have will always be uh, the inner product between rho pi and r pi, where rho pi is the stationary distribution it converges to. And why in many cases we can assume this team mix bound so a certain uh, counter example why one might want to raise is that suppose we have a cycle as a graph so it is an ap periodic graph and it might not have mixing time at all and a classical trick to deal with that is one can consider the lazy random walk where uh we can consider instead of a p pi uh, a half probability staying at itself and a half probability following the transition of p pi. This is a trick to make aperiodic uh, graphs like cycles to also have bounded mixing time. And also, suppose we are only considering deterministic transitions on the graphs where one can uniformly tra uh, transit to all the neighbors that it is connecting to, then the typical bound for mixing time 
is a uh, proportional to the size of the state as square for regular graphs and as to the cube for general unweighted graphs. So this is the assumption we are going to make about the mixing time on average reward MDP. And an MDP can have different types of policies that we look at. The ultimate goal is definitely to find the optimal policy that maximizes the cumulative reward as we defined earlier. However, because we it is very uh, computational inefficient to find the exact optimal policy, so what we usually do is to find an approximately optimal policy, which means that the cumulative reward is additively close to the optimal. This is the goal of our study, and we are going to make the standard assumption of a generator model access, which means that we can query a state action pair and the model will tell us the next state it, it will transit to based on the probability transition. So this is a different model and usually uh, thought of as a more powerful one in comparison to the reinforcement learning model and also in the model where people consider the regret of the problem. So this is considered a stronger model and this problem of sample complexity under this model access for Markov decision process is uh, believed to be like a first question to answer before going to the regress setting and for the reinforcement learning studies. So first of all, I'd like to survey a few prior results for understanding discounted MDP. So there, there has been a very nice answer for this problem where the upper bound has been shown in 2020 to be a total over one minus gamma cube epsilon square. Here, a total means the total number of state action pairs. And also the lower bound has been proven way earlier, but it has also shown that this upper bound is tight. So the lower bound is also this quantity. So, Actually, there has been a long line of work that finally get this nearly tight upper bound, uh, like up to logarithmic factors. So when the paper at, for, by Aza et al. in 2013 first raised this lower bound, they have shown a suboptimal upper bound that has a suboptimal dependence on one minus gamma. And later it has been improved by a series of works using convex optimization algorithm, but require extra assumption on ergodicity tau. And it has been also uh, used variance reduced value iteration, variance reduced Q learning or online learning based methods to improve the dependence on the one minus gamma factor all the way to this nearly optimal bound that has been obtained in 2019 by Sidford, uh, Wang, Wu, Yang, and Ye. And although this a bound is nearly optimal, it requires a strict restricted regime for the epsilon parameter in order for this to hold. So it requires epsilon to be smaller than a constant. However, because we are estimating the value of the discounted MDP, which can usually be as large as one over one minus gamma. So one would uh, naturally want to relax the regime where this near optimal sample complexity can hold. And here comes the later follow up works. So from a statistical perspective, the later works also show the same nearly tight upper bound complexity, but relax the regime where this uh, sam sample complexity holds to first epsilon to the one over square root one minus gamma. And finally, in the 2020, it has been shown for all regime of epsilon, this nearly uh, tight sample complexity bound actually holds. I need to remark that uh, the latest two works in this slide are based on a statistical perspective, which means that they prove that the sample complexity of this much would, enough, would be enough to construct uh, an empirical MDP and one can solve that empirical MDP to get a good enough uh, policy for the original MDP. However, I'm not aware of an um, algorithmic method that can directly get these sample complexity and runtime without paying extra one over one minus gamma factors. So in terms of algorithmic, I believe it is still open to do epsilon larger than one regime for the, this nearly tight sample complexity. 
Yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I raise yeah. my right hand, but maybe you don't see it. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by algorithmic. Like, why is it not an algorithm to collect all the data, build a model, solve the model? That's an algorithm. We can use policy iteration to do that. It has a well controlled computational complexity. What's the problem? Yeah, I guess the question is that the computational complexity, you need to pay a, an additional factor because because if you're running policy iteration or value iteration, then there is an additional like one over one minus gamma iteration you need to pay in order to solve these problems computationally. So, so there is two issues. Uh, what's the total compute cost and what is the total sample complexity? Oh, and... yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree these methods will have the same sample complexity. Sorry, this is my bad. I actually mean the computational cost of this. I think there might be improve, uh, room for improvement. Really? I mean, so uh, that that becomes really challenging because if you have a finite MDP, we have policy iteration and we have this strong polynomiality results for the discounted setting for policy iteration now that says that if you keep the discount factor fixed then uh, you can compute the optimal policy in poly time in the size of the state action space and uh, the order of the polynomial is not too high so uh, it's okay so you're saying that there you you can maybe aim for tuning the order of the polynomial but that seems like really challenging and so maybe from an upper bond perspective you could have I guess what I'm trying to say but... is that I guess what I'm trying to say is that for the computational cost, I think the right answer is also this same thing, like a total, like the leading term should be a total over one minus gamma cube epsilon square. I think the I think the strongly polynomial results based on policy iteration or like simplex like formulation and then some right, thing right i mean that. that would be independent of epsilon squared so how do we even compare that right like that yeah, would yeah, say yeah, that you can compute what... optimal policy regardless of your epsilon because you compute it exactly uh so now we have like two very different things because in one epsilon appears in the other epsilon doesn't appear so maybe we could hope for the best of both words but it's it's not very clear to me that you know, one is uh, unilaterally beating the other one. Uh, uh, if epsilon yeah, is yeah. really small, then an algorithm that whose sample complexity, or sorry, computational complexity, not the sample complexity, yeah, yeah, it really depends on epsilon. Then that that's losing for small epsilons. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think yeah, like I I think what you are saying is essentially there are two typical computational methods. One is like work for high accuracy when epsilon is small it has logarithmic dependence on one over epsilon but or needs low dependence. to pay low dependence but needs to pay extra dimensional factor based on state and action and okay. what i'm trying to focus here is the sublinear like runtime or rates where it only has like this a total which equals to sa dependence and i'm hoping like it is okay to pay like extra one over one minus gamma and one over epsilon factors yes i see Okay. These are two gotcha. Clear. That's a very good question. So, this is the prior works on discounted MDP, and yeah, I'm also like only considering these sublinear runtimes and sample complexity in the survey here. So there are much uh, more work on the strongly polynomial and other log one over epsilon dependence work for discounted MDP. And one thing I want to remark is that a lot of these analysis require a somewhat tight variance analysis of the Markov chain. So the high level idea uh, that the key lemma, in my opinion, that is used in all of these works is that they have some way of analyzing the variance of this Markov chain. And they show that this variance is bounded. They're using this fact to obtain a lot of the nice uh, like improvement, like from one over one minus gamma fourth to one over one minus gamma third. You may see it in different forms, but these are all in some sense relying on this nice observation of Markov chain. So what about the average reward? The average reward, we naturally don't have this control of the variance of the Markov chain because typically we are raising gamma to one 
and this variance can go to uh, infinity or an unbounded number just when we are raising uh, t to infinity. So we don't have this nice control, and this is a very like a uh, like a uh, simple reason that some of the analysis of the prior work that gets tight discounted MDP sample complexity is not immediately applicable to the average reward case. So we want to study this average reward problem, and this is the upper bounds and lower bounds that is non prior to us. So it is a very nice work by uh, Wang in 2017. So Mandy showed that this, you can get a sample complexity of tau to the fourth a total t mix square over epsilon square, where tau is again the ergodicity uh, bound that we will, our algorithm will not depend on. So I'm not going to introduce its uh, definition, but in the worst case, tau can grow as large as like super linear in the size of the states. And t mix is the mixing time that we have introduced the definition earlier. So this is the work that has been known prior to us, and our sequence of works shows an alternative upper bound of the minimum of a total times t mix square over epsilon square and a total t mix over epsilon cube. So this is achieved by two uh, subsequent works, and we also show a lower bound of a total t mix over epsilon square. So as you can see, this is still not tight yet. It is only tight in the regime where T mix is a constant or epsilon is a constant. So there is still a gap here that we are trying to close right now in our current work. And we tend to believe that the lower bound is more like the right answer. And we are trying to go toward that. So these uh, upper bounds are based on different frameworks and methods. So for the first upper bound we show, this is based on a general convex framework for Markov decision process, where we design a new stochastic mirror descent algorithm for our infinity regression. The second upper bound is based on the reduction to discounted MDP, where we demonstrate the connections between average reward MDP and discounted MDP. And the lower bound is the first characterization of this problem's hardness in terms of the mixing time T mix. So to compare a little bit of our two upper bounds, they all have their uh, different like strengths and characteristics. So the first one would be better for the small mixing time regime, and the latter one would be better for the larger accuracy regime. And the first one uses dynamic samples, which means that the algorithm needs to uh, up, keep update the sampling distribution that we are querying the generative access model. So we assume there is a sample that we are going to sample state action pair and query the generative model for the state action pair. And this distribution is changing throughout the uh, way of the algorithm. On the other hand, the latter algorithm only uses oblivious samples, which means that we only need to collect the samples for all state action pairs in the very beginning and then as you can see, this can allow parallel computing for obtaining these samples. And the first algorithm also uses a stronger mixing assumption, which means that it requires all the randomized stationary policies to satisfy the T mix mixing time bound. The latter one, however, only requires a weaker mixing assumption. It only requires that all the deterministic policies would need a T mix mixing time bound. So in the end, I'm going to remark that the first algorithm is also algorithmic, which means that the runtime of the algorithm is the same as the sample complexity I'm showing here. And the latter one is a statistical argument, which means that this much sample complexity is enough and we can use other algorithm <clears throat> on this many sample complexity to achieve the epsilon approximate uh, policy. However, we do not know if there exists an algorithm that directly achieved this a total T mix over epsilon cube runtime as well. So also in terms of our lower bound, our lower bound considers all algorithms that output deterministic policies and use oblivious samples. So you can see that in this sense, it is saying that our lower bound and the upper bound, the second upper bound, uh, it is tied in the constant 
epsilon regime because it is considering the same, same model of oblivious samples and deterministic policies. Oh, uh, we have a, we think we, we think it is not hard to also generalize this lower bound construction to work for randomized policies and use arbitrary like sampling distributions. But we are not like including that in our paper for simplicity, but we think that this lower bound one can indeed show a similar lower bound for that case as well. And also all the uh, sample complexity I'm listing here, I'm omitting the logarithmic factors. So there are some logarithmic dependence in the upper bound. So next I'm going to talk about these three methods that we achieve these three sample complexity for the upper bounds and lower bounds respectively. So the first one is based on stochastic mirror descent and I'm going to show how we formulate the problem, what algorithm we design to solve the problem and how we get a policy based on the solution of the problem. So the first thing that is known in literature is that there's this linear programming formulation of MDP and one can equivalently read wrote it as the min-max problem as follows, which has already been shown in 2017 in Mandy's paper. So this is the min-max problem based on Lagrangian duality, and the V vectors here corresponds to the value vectors when people are doing value iteration, and the mu variable here lies in a simplex space, which is a total or SA dimensional, which usually is known as the state action distribution or you can think of it as the occupancy measure, or in the discounted case, it corresponds to the expected visitation for each state action pair. So this is the meaning of the primal and dual variables. And this matrix P is the dimension A total times S matrix, where we have all the probability transition matrix. So this is the min max formulation. And we actually notice that it follows from a classical form of matrix games, which is this min max formulation uh, de decided by a matrix M. And this problem's hardness is usually depending on the smoothness parameter, which is some norm of this matrix M, which is also known as the condition number. So <clears throat> this decides the problem's hardness. And in our particular case, this matrix norm uh, because of the geometry of L infinity and L1 on primal and dual side corresponds to the maximum L1 norm of the rows uh, of the rows uh, L1 norm. So you can observe that because we're considering probability matrix, this is a constant. So it will naturally correspond to a problem which we call L infinity regression or min max games with a very good condition number. There are many classical algorithms people have already designed for solving L infinity regression. So <clears throat> the first one is smooth function approximation or dual extrapolation designed by Namirovsky and Nastrov. So these problems apply into a an min max problem in this formulation. When the condition number is good, we'll have this much entry wise queries. So it has been later improved by a Sherman the, the so-called Sherman algorithm to this entry-wise queries. But as you can see, because all these methods are deterministic methods, they will require matrix vector products at each iteration. And both of these algorithms are linear in, the, in terms of the complexity. So what we design is a stochastic mirror descent method that applies to this problem and more generally L infinity regression. And the total entry-wise query we need is a total times t mix square over epsilon square. So as you can see, this achieves the sublinear dependence, which is also desirable in sample complexity. And because every time we only query the coordinate in expectation, so it suffices to generate samples from the generated model and is suitable for the model access that we are assuming. So in comparison to Mandy's work in 2017, it is a very similar framework and the algorithm is only slightly different in terms of the parameters we choose. However, we show that there is a more canonical way of analyzing it that uh, can maybe apply to more broader class of MDP problems, MDP instances and L infinity regression problems. 
So next, I'm going to briefly talk about the stochastic mirror descent approach. So in the more familiar stochastic gradient descent setting, what we are usually do is that we consider an gradient estimator G tilde, and we'll take an approximate uh, gradient step based on this G tilde. Uh, so I, yeah. May I ask a quick question? Uh, yeah. So maybe I just phased out, but uh, where did L infinity regression come come up, come in, into yes. the picture? So, the, how is it defined? And Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because the min max problem we are considering is where V is lying on an L infinity space and mu is lying on a simplex space. So you can quotient out one side. So for example, if you are quotienting out the uh, V side, then you can just write it as the uh, minimizing the L infinity norm of uh, mu transpose P minus I. So there will, so if you're quotienting out the main side, then there will naturally be an L infinity norm coming up in the problem. So it will be an instance of L infinity regression. Uh, okay, so here you are, you're, you mean regression in a very general sense. It's basically like if you want to, I don't know, maximize, minimize some L infinity norm, then that, that's that's what you're calling a regression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the you can think of, uh, so if you are quotienting out this part, you can think of the objective as there is an L infinity norm, which is your loss function, and then you are doing the regression in the sense right. that you're trying see. to find a mu that fits the, fits the, I see. Something. Yeah. And then you can use your generative model or whatnot to actually set up a regression-like problem with targets and yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So, okay. So now I'm going to talk about stochastic methods, which is different from the prior, uh, like classical algorithms we survey on the L infinity regression problem. So the stochastic gradient descent considers like an unconstrained uh, step update where it considers this distance function to be standard Euclidean L2 norm squared. So if you're writing this update formula where the distance is Euclidean L2 and it is unconstrained, then you can show it is equivalent to stochastic gradient descent, as long as G tilde is an unbiased estimator of the actual gradient GT. So in contrast, stochastic mirror descent has two differences. So first of all, at every step it does a projection because it cares about the geometry. So usually when we do stochastic mirror descent, we are not dealing with like an unconstrained Euclidean geometry. For example, in here we are doing uh, box and simplex geometry. And also we are considering a generalized norm in the distance function. So we might not only consider L2 norm square for the distance, but for example, for the simplex, we can consider KL divergence. We can consider weighted L2 norm square. There are all sorts of distance functions that we are allowed to consider. So. Essentially, the, when the geometry of the problem matters and we want to benefit from it, we will part, in particular choose to use stochastic mirror descent. So the well-known stochastic mirror descent guarantee is that the regret for all t iterations is bounded by the summation of these two terms. So here are two factors that will affect the convergence rate. The first one, is depending on the domain size that is measured by the distance function we choose. So if we choose a different distance function, it will induce a different domain size between arbitrary two points measured under that distance function. And this will affect our uh, regret, which we use the notation of theta. The second part is the variance of our design gradient estimator under the proper, proper dual norm. So we denote it by sigma square, and it is measured on the dual norm that is the dual of the uh, norm we consider in the distance function. So the well-established stochastic mirror design guarantee says that the duality gap or the arrow of the solution, in order for it to bound it by epsilon, we can choose eta optimally to trade off these two terms and get that after picking t equals to theta sigma square over epsilon square steps, 
we can obtain a duality gap that is bounded by constant order of epsilon. So this is the total number of iterations we need depending on the domain size theta and the variance of estimator sigma square. So in our particular problem, what are we going to choose for the distance measure and the stochastic gradient estimator? So here are our choices. So for the box side or for the L infinity side, we are going to just choose a standard Euclidean L2 norm. So this is not the tightest thing we can get for the theta parameter. However, we show this actually doesn't matter because this part is the not dominating term. So the distance measured under this, because we're considering a L infinity ball that is rescaled by T mix. So this is going to be S times T mix square. And the estimator, essentially we are just going to sample a state action pair from the distribution mu and then use the generator model to access the next state based on uh, to get an unbiased estimator of this gradient gv that we have here so you can show that this variance when analyzed in the l2 norm which is the dual norm also uh, for l2 itself the variance will be bounded by a constant next for the simplex side then what is the distance measure we are going to choose? I guess it's kind of like a standard in literature that for simplex variables or L1 variables, we are going to choose uh, entropy for the simplex uh, part. So if you analyze the distance under the entropy uh, function, then you can show that it is bounded by logarithmic times the dimension A total which is on the order of O tilde one and is corresponding to the logarithmic factor I'm hiding earlier. And also for the estimators, what we are going to do is we are going to sample a state action pair uniformly and then generate the next state based on the state action pair using the generated model and get the V based on the iterates we keep. So as we can show, by this way, the variance will be T mix square A total on the order of this. So the T mix coming from that order V has values that is bounded by T mix. So you have this rescaling factor of T mix square in the variance. And A total comes from that we are sampling state action pair uh, uniformly randomly from all the possible state action pairs. So when you're computing the variance, there will also be an additional A total factor coming from here. So we remarked that we actually need to use the variance analysis in terms of the local norm for L1 analysis. And this has also been shown to get tight uh, matrix games runtimes in previous, previous works of me and other collaborators. And we believe it is a pretty standard uh, technique that can be used for getting tight variance analysis for simplex uh, side updates. So <clears throat> this is the distance measure and estimators we will have. And the variance analysis is the most technical part to show. And by looking at this trade-off of theta sigma square over epsilon square, by timing, uh, by multiplying the distance measure induced theta and the estimator's variance sigma square on both sides and then summing them up together, we can show a total number of iteration a total plus s times t mix square over epsilon square. So this is the total number of uh, iteration. And since every iteration, we are only taking uh, one sample for the primal side and one sample for the dual side from the generated model. So this is also the sample complexity of the algorithm. And as you can see, the actual bottlenecking part is the simplex side. So a natural idea that uh, one might want to explore in future work is to see if there is a more tight analysis of the variance on the dual side, uh, on the simplex side, so that we can improve this total number of iteration and also improve the sample complexity. So if this way is working out, it might improve both the runtime and the sample complexity together. Sorry, can, can I just ask a yeah. quick, quick clarification question? So yeah. I, I didn't get this because uh, are you shooting for reducing the dependence on the mixing time from quadratic to linear or, or what would be the goal here? 
I think because, the goal is essentially reducing that mixing time to tmix squared to right. T. Because I I see also a tmix squared uh, coming from the box side, the value function side. Oh 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 yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. I think that one also needs to be improved. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, just I'm... just clarifying here. Yeah 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 yeah. yeah. You're, you're, okay. That that's being right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, yeah. but I guess we have not been trying very hard for the distance measurement in L2 norm in the box side also. Like there we are just using standard L2 norm and there are ways that uh, based on ideas in recent advances that one might want to use different uh, norms that might have a better uh, improvement in terms of this. So we are, because this is not the bottleneck part in our algorithm, so we are not trying to optimize it at very hard. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if there exists like better uh, ways to measure the distance here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is the total runtime and sample complexity that we managed to show. And can I ask a yeah. <laughs> I need a clarification question uh, regarding this. So previous slide. Yeah. On the left. Can, can you go back one slide? I guess you have to click on a screen to for it to update on our screen. Oh, sorry. Like that. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah. Oh okay. Okay. And then the next one, because now I see the technique assembly for L infinity regression slide. Uh, if you go to the next slide, and yeah, like just yeah, okay. This this is where I wanted to be. Uh, so the like where is where is it coming that the mixing time is actually squared on the box side for this distance measure? Wasn't this the basically the diameter of the the set? Yes, and yes. Then... This is the diameter of the set. Okay, but I see that the scaling of the diameter should be just linear with the mixing time. Oh, uh, but like here distance measure, we are computing the L2 norm square. So like- So the average... squared, okay, so the, okay. That, that's why it is being squared, I see. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right. But I, I think it. like it, like there is some hope that some better analysis can get a better dependent on tmix because like there are deterministic algorithms that does not use square this tmix uh, like dependence in the entry wise query. So a natural hope is that possibly one can, if one is clever enough, one can define like a stochastic like, randomized counterpart of this that also like have this uh, better dependence on the tmix as well. Uh -huh. Okay, so Sean had a quick question. Uh, can you elaborate on how you are extracting a policy at the end? Yeah, yeah, because... yeah. That's exactly the yeah. next part I'm going to do. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, so now this is a very great question because I'm going to answer it. Now, we only show that we have a good primal dual solution of the main next problem. So the question is, how do we obtain also a good policy? So this is actually the major contribution of our prior work, because as I mentioned, the algorithm is very similar. And the actual part that we are saving from the ergodicity parameter and all those things is because we have a, a better rounding to the good uh, policy. So first of all, how do we obtain a policy from the primal dual solution? So our dual solution is actually a distribution over all the state action pair. So a very natural idea is that it can induce both a distribution over the states and for each state, a distribution over the actions. And the natural idea is to argue that this policy as the distribution over the actions will be a good enough policy for our purpose. So next I'm going to say why this is true. So suppose we decompose this state action distribution into the distribution over states time the policy parameter, then we can see that this pi actually gives a policy, which we assume the stationary distribution is rho pi. Then in some sense, we can show that this rho pi and the lambda epsilon as the distribution over states induced by mu 
are very close in certain norms. So by primal dual optimality, what we can show is that uh, the lambda epsilon uh, like applied to the left to this matrix P pi minus I will have L1 norm that is bounded on the order of epsilon over T mix. So this is directly uh, derived from the primal dual optimality of the solution. And this would imply this inequality to be true because rho pi is a stationary distribution. So by definition, rho pi transpose p pi minus i should be zero. So we can just subtracting it from phi. And <clears throat> it is not hard to show after some derivations that this also implies the L1 norm of lambda epsilon minus rho pi is bounded by epsilon using the property that p pi has mixing time bounded by T mix. So these are the norm bounds that we can show. And what's nice about it? So now we want to bound the quality of this policy pi from pi epsilon, which we, sub, uh, which we abstract from the dual solution mu. So the quality of this v pi is just the inner product between the stationary rho pi and the r pi, where r is the instantaneous reward at each step. Because rho pi is a stationary distribution, we can add rho pi transpose p pi minus i back because it equals to zero. So we're just adding it back for free. And then we can rearrange term. So what we do is that we subtract lambda epsilon on both two terms and add it back. So we, uh, we write rho pi to be rho pi minus lambda epsilon plus lambda epsilon and multiply it by the right-hand side vectors. And then after some algebra, this is just like try to separate the first term into the two terms. So one is multiplying it by p pi minus i times v star, and the second one is multiplying the vector by r pi. So these are very simple rearranging terms. And then what is nice about our previous argument is that we can use the fact of the L1 norm bound of the, uh, of the vectors to show that this is bounded by epsilon over T mix. And for the second part, we can use the previous L1 norm bound of these stationary, of these distributions to show that this term is also lower bounded by minus epsilon. And in the very end, what we can show is that following from the duality gap, we can show this term is bounded just by the optimal value of the optimal policy minus epsilon. So this comes from the duality gap is bounded by epsilon. So combining all these three inequalities together, what we essentially prove is that v pi is lower bounded by v pi star minus three epsilon. What does this say? This is that the policy pi we abstract from the dual solution mu is a good enough policy because it is three epsilon close to the optimal policy pi star. And the argument we gave is basically based on primal dual optimality of the min max problem. So this is another reason why I think this min max problem is very nice structured because the primal dual optimality actually also guarantees the optimality of the approximate policy that has been that can be uh, obtained from the dual solution mean. Can I ask a clarification question? Yeah. So, so this was critically hinging upon the computed lambda epsilon to yes. be near stationary up yes. to epsilon over the mixing time. Yes. And the larger the mixing time, the better this is, which is a bit surprising. Uh, so did, did you mean that you're computing the solution up to this accuracy, epsilon over tau or T-mix, or, or just happens? The reason is because we are allowing V to be in this box that has been rescaled by T-mix. So if we are solving this to epsilon accuracy, because all the V is essentially like T mix in its L infinity norm, then 
you can bound this vector of mu transpose p minus i to be bounded by epsilon over t mix because like we are dividing the size of this t mix. So maybe a way to think of this is that the larger the t mix is to solving to the same accuracy of epsilon, it is harder because we need to ensure that this mu transpose p minus i is closer to zero because if it's like a little bit away from zero, then because V belongs to T mix, it can make this very, very tiny and ruin the optimality of the problem. I, I wonder whether like there is some subtlety here uh, because if the optimal value function actually doesn't have the big range of the T mix range, uh -huh. the procedure is going to go for an approximation to that value function. And so somehow like you shouldn't be able to to divide off that t mix range because the, the 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 value function that you're computing is actually pretty small as well if if you if the procedure works well so it's it must be a very subtle argument it's like yeah yeah like, the idea is that <clears throat> no matter how the value function so so let's say the value vector can be any value inside the T-mix bounded range. So it can be also very close to zero. It can be just on the constant order. The trick we are going to do is that we allow this actual V variable we consider to be bounded in the size of like a constant times T-mix. So sure. like we assume this is like two T-mix size of this L, uh, L box constraint and then the argument is saying that uh, the dual optimality of uh, v, uh, sorry, of v is like good enough bounded by epsilon, which means that the optimal v, which can be like very close to zero compared with arbitrary v, will achieve a good enough like epsilon approximation. And what that means is that when we considering arbitrary arbitrary v, like we would we would be better like putting V on the boundary of the constraint we are considering. Yeah. So if V is close in to zero or like close inside this T mix, it will be farther away from the two T mix size vector that we are com comparing with. This will only like increase the, this will only make this uh, quantity of L infinity norm smaller because like we are showing that the, for the very different vectors, mm -hmm. uh, this quantity is still very small, which means that each entry of this vector mu transpose p minus i must be very small. Or, or you could also have just answered me by saying that, look, if I didn't scale up this box with T mix and I demand an epsilon upper, approximate solution, you would get it. But like if I scale it up, then that's like dividing the accuracy by T mix. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I get it. Thanks. Yeah. So this is a very great question. Like this is essentially the primal dual optimality like in the design of the algorithm we are trying to utilize here to ensure mm -hmm. that we can show this nice L infinity norm bounds. Mm -hmm. So this allows us to bound the quality of the policy. And here we show that also, like similarly for the discounted case, our framework also works, but it loses an additional one over one minus gamma factor compared to the state of the art. However, it is still like the uh, best sample complexity and runtime one can achieve that is known in the literature by using convex optimization techniques. And it remains open, as I mentioned earlier, how to close this gap by purely using like convex optimization techniques. So Mandy has also proven a similar bound for the discounted case with uh, ergodicity dependence. So the contribution in the discounted case is we use a different rounding scheme to remove this ergodicity dependence by using the primal dual optimality similar to the one we are discussing on the average case here. So the next thing I'm go going to talk about is the upper bound based on reduction to discounted MDP. I'll try to accelerate a little bit. So these are like, this is a rather simple idea. So the idea is that now we are solving average reward MDP, 
So what we can do is we can solve a discounted MDP when the gamma is very close to one and hope that the value of the discounted MDP and the average word MDP is very close. So the value of the discounted MDP when we considering discount factor gamma is on the order of one over one minus gamma. And the average reward MDP, like assuming the reward is zero one bounded because it is the inner product of stationary distribution times uh, reward, instantaneous reward. So it's bounded by zero one. So the main observation we are going to make is that the value of the average reward minus one minus gamma times the value of the discounted reward, assuming the same probability transitions can be very close depending on this one minus gamma times T mix quantity. So here we are multiplying the value vector for the discounted MDP because we want to properly rescale it so that they are on the same support and we can actually hope these to be close. So this is not too crazy to show. The way we are going to prove this is that we write first the value of the average reward MDP as an infinite series by timing it of one, timing a one minus gamma and summing the same quantity uh, from uh, gamma to the power of zero all the way to gamma to the power of T. And for the discounted MDP, it naturally has this infinite sum power times by gamma to the T uh, things that you can write down as. So now to subtract the two, <clears throat> we can just subtract bounded by subtracting each uh, term in the infinite series individually. So this is going to be the upper bound. And as you can see, this essentially boils down to arguing how P pi converges to the stationary distribution for all the states that we start with. So using the fact of the mixing condition, we can show that <clears throat> The, this key lemma is actually true when, <clears throat> when we multiply the value of the discounted MDP by one minus gamma, this can be closed quantitatively by, bounded by this factor. So utilizing this observation, what we essentially did for our second upper bound is just to say that, okay, now we can reduce average reward MDP to discounted MDP. We can reduce to one that has uh, that all the values are epsilon close to the corresponding average reward MDP we are solving, which essentially means that we want to solve a discounted MDP when we pick gamma to be on the order of one minus epsilon over T mix. And then for this uh, discounted MDP, the accuracy we want to solve is when multiplying it to one minus gamma, it is bounded by epsilon. So for each discounted MDP, we want to solve it in terms of accuracy to epsilon over one minus gamma. So this ensures in both these steps, the error incurred is only epsilon when approximating the values of average reward MDP. And then we know that the state of the art discounted MDP is a total over one minus gamma cube var epsilon square, where var epsilon is the accuracy we solve the discounted MDP, plugging in the choice of gamma and var epsilon, this will immediately give the sample complexity a total T mix over epsilon cube. Okay, so this is a very simple argument by just observing the relationship between average reward and discounted. So the crucial reason why this is actually a later work of our prior work and why we haven't realized this uh, improved like uh, sample complexity in certain regime in comparison to our prior work is because that it crucially relies on the 2020 work by Li et al that improves the epsilon regime of the earlier works on sample complexity for the discounted case. So if you recall the epsilon regime that works for the prior works, the prior works only argue the tight sample complexity when the var epsilon is smaller than one over root one minus gamma. And this by our particular choice of var epsilon and gamma actually corresponds to the case where the mixing time is always smaller than one over epsilon. 
So the earlier works regime are exactly the regime where our first upper bound is always dominating the second upper bound we show. And it is because this recent development that improves the epsilon regime that we can show that we also have this alternative upper bound that can be improving over the first sample complexity we show in certain cases. Yeah. So in the end, I'll talk about the lower bound construction, which is also using the idea of lower bound construction in the discounted MDP setting. So this hard instance construction, it might look like a very big figure, but I'm going to explain it level by level. So essentially, it is composed of three level of states, which is the same as the discounted MDP hard instance. And in the first level, it has n states where each state has k actions. I'm denoting the different actions by the blue arrows here. In the second state, it has a total of k n states. So all the different actions transit to different states in level two, and it only has one action per state. So the red arrows are corresponding to the actions in states of level two. And in level three, it also has k n states that is one to one correspondence to states in level two, and each state also only has one action per state. So I'm using the green arrows here to denote the transitions of actions in states in level three. So in total, this is a construction that has a total of k times n state action pairs. Okay, so the level in level one, we assume that all the states have k different actions that transit to different states at level two. And at level two, we assume that there is only one single action for each state where with one minus gamma probability, it refreshes, which means it will uniformly transform randomly to an arbitrary state in level one. And with gamma p probability, it will stay at its self's own state with this self loop. And with gamma times one minus p probability, it will go to states at level three. And in level three, we will have each individual state that has one minus gamma refreshing probability, which means that with one minus gamma probability, it will go uniformly randomly to an arbitrary state in level one again. And with gamma probability, it will stay on its own states for, uh, forever. And the major uh, structure of this MDP instance that allows us to argue about the lower bound are two parts. So the first part is that we assume all the instantaneous reward is zero, except when a level two state is staying at itself over uh, by taking this transition of self loop. So we are going to change. Uh, so the best action for each state in level one actually becomes that if it has a higher probability of staying at the itself's own state in level two. So the goal we are going to do in our construction is that we're going to hide a better P star, a higher probability of staying at itself in level two among all the P's in each K actions. So this is the similar idea to the discounted MDP Harding's construction. The second key structure is that we have this refreshing probability, which means that for all the states in level two and level three, it will uniformly randomly has one minus gamma probability going back to an arbitrary state in level one. So this is essentially say allowing the instance to mix very quickly because it also has a certain probability of going to states in level one and start from scratch from the beginning. So we can formally prove that by allowing this refreshing probability, the mixing time of any policy will always be bounded by one over one minus gamma. So this will ensure the mixing bound of this instance is bounded by one over one minus gamma. And then the argument is as follows. 
So we are going to hide a best probability of staying as itself in level two states. So the best P we are going to pick is on the order of gamma plus epsilon times one minus gamma. And the suboptimal probabilities of staying at itself in level two states will correspond to P equals to gamma. So as you can see, P star is slightly better than P, which will incur a better uh, uh, total average reward for the instance. And then the problem for each chain, for each state in level one, will correspond to a multi-arm banded uh, argument in because we want to essentially figure out the best arm or the best action we want to take in the states in level one. So in order to identify this best arm, we need to take enough samples for many uh, states in level two to figure out what is the probability they are going to stay at themselves. And formally, <clears throat> we can prove that we need at least k over one minus gamma times epsilon square number of samples to find a single best action. And also by using the refreshing probability to argue the mixing time is bounded by one over one minus gamma, this sample complexity to find a single best action corresponds to k times t mix over epsilon square number of samples to find one best action. So following this argument, we can show that in order to find an epsilon optimal policy, because of our choice of P and P star and the stationary distribution structure, we need to at least be correct of finding at least a constant fraction of the best actions for all the level one states, which means that we need to find at least a constant fraction of N best actions for level one states. And because for each state, we need K times T mix over epsilon square samples. So in total, we will need to require a number of samples that is N times K times T mix over epsilon square. So this is the total number of sample complexity. And I want to remark that in comparison to the hard instance in discounted MDP, so in the discounted MDP, the goal is to estimate all the value vectors for the uh, for for the entire discounted MDP instance up to epsilon accuracy. So it is more like saying for arbitrary initial distribution starting at a single state, we want to uh, estimate the uh, value or the policies value for each initial distribution up to epsilon accuracy. However, here we are only making an argument that we want to find uh, the best, uh, uh, we want to estimate the epsilon optimal policy for some fixed initial stationary, for some fixed distribution. So the difference is that for the discounted MDP hard instance, they are arguing for an L infinity bound on the value vectors. And for the uh, hard instance here, the lower bound we are proving is only for the, uh, the values under some fixed stationary distribution. Right. So yeah. that's the reason why we are like a logarithmic factor uh, smaller in terms of our lower bound compared with the discounted MDP. Is, so that, we... is that really true? Uh, I mean, for the discounted proof really does go through for the same problem where you have a fixed initial state and you're just interested in uh, whether an ergotum can figure out what action to take from that initial state uh, such that it's epsilon suboptimal. I think that you can modify the argument that was given on the original paper uh, to also get the same lower bound. That was... I think it might be one logarithmic factor smaller. I'm not completely. Okay, so we do like full disclosure, like we did this calculation, it does work out. Oh, you uh, mean for the yeah. same logarithmic factor dependence? No, no, there, there is no need for a log factor loss for the discounted setting. There is no loss of a log factor. Do you know the initial distribution beforehand? Yeah, yeah. It, okay. It's just uniform or something. 
OK 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 that is good to know OK I thought the reason why we lose a logarithmic factor is probably because of this fact but based on what you have said we might be actually a yeah. little bit lost in our analysis and there might be an extra <laughs> logarithmic factor that is yeah. coming from some more careful analysis yeah that is good to know right OK yeah OK so and k is the total number of state action pairs. Oh, another thing to uh, point out is that this lower bound instance actually also not only has n k total state action pairs, but also has a total of n k states. So a question one might ask is that whether this is just suggesting a, a, a like a state number times a, a t mix over epsilon square a lower bound. So our answer is we think you can modify the instance to allow it to have only n states and k actions on average per state to ensure that this is actually a lower bound in terms of the total number of state action pairs instead of the only the total number of states. So this we haven't written out, but we believe the calculations should work out. So <clears throat> you can actually argue that this is the lower bound for the total number of state action pairs. And here are some like future directions that I will briefly uh, touch upon due to the short of time. So uh, the first uh, natural question is whether we can actually obtain nearly tight sample complexity for the average reward MDP. And even in terms of that, we can also ask the question of whether these nearly tight sample complexity for average reward MDP would imply an algorithm with the same runtime or like, can we relax the assumption on the mixing time to further argue about the sam make some sample complexity arguments? So another direction is the generalization of this uh, stochastic mirror descent method we talked about in the first half, half of the talk in the reinforcement learning setting. So different uh, algorithms in solving MDP corresponds to different uh, types of algorithms in the reinforcement learning setting. And we wonder whether this uh, min max formulation and stochastic de mirror descent can be useful in, for example, uh, certain off policy reinforcement learning problems. Because I, I believe there are some prior works that has been done by very nice researchers on arguing that by looking at this formulation in the off policy reinforcement learning setting, you can reduce the variance in your algorithm. So some uh, there are some research that has been done following this line. So another question echoing the earlier question is that uh, can we obtain actually high accuracy solution to Markov decision processes and in particular for average reward Markov decisions. So here typically for high accuracy we refer to like logarithmic one over epsilon dependence kind of algorithms. So there are this these uh, strongly polynomial algorithms that is based on linear programming and uh, simplex method. And people might too also wonder in these high accuracy regimes, what are the right answer and the right dimension and parameter dependence for the discounted MDPs and average reward MDPs. So these are the natural future directions. And this is the end of this talk today. Thank you very much. You're very welcome to ask any questions. So uh, let me jump in just very quick and then maybe I give the stage to others after that. Uh, so this very last question that you are asking, this log one over epsilon accuracy, uh, wouldn't an interior point method get this if it just like goes for the simplex, for the uh, for the prime dua formulation for the min max game? And uh, assuming that uh, you have access, of course, to the precise transition properties and everything, uh, yeah. so I would be really surprised if it didn't give you that, right? Like it will, but it will have just like a poor dependence on the number of state action pairs and maybe the mixing time. The mixing time may not be that bad, but uh, the number of state action pairs, the dependence on that would be like some really high order polynomial, like six or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't do the count calculations carefully, but I, I believe you. I think the typical linear programming approach applied to the problem will be like, 
I mean, it seems to me that it is losing some structure of the markup decision process. So if you look at the recent advances that uh, some of the people have made on solving like directed Laplacian or solving uh, tall dense matrices using linear programming, I believe some of these results can also get high accuracy solution for markup decision processes with slightly better, uh, with slightly better like uh, this like uh, dimension dependence. So I think, for example, the there is this uh, solving the tall dense matrices work that has been made by Aaron and all those also his collaborators that I think applying to the problem will have like as. Uh, let me see. I think it will give something like s square a plus s cube or plus a cube times log one over epsilon. This kind of uh, complexity, and it is better than the uh, like directly applying the most generic linear programming approach to argue right. about the dimension dependence. But I guess a natural question is because there are so many structure in this problem, like right whether you can actually hope you can solve it in linear, in like uh, nearly linear time, whether there is like actually S square A log one over epsilon dependence algorithm for the problem. Right, that, that, that's even open for the discounted setting, right? Yeah, that's, that's open for the discounted setting, yes. Okay, as we discussed before, good. Uh, okay, thanks. Thanks. So I have some questions regarding these uh, mixing conditions and whatnot showing up in the upper and the lower bands. So in in this lower band example, I understand mm -hmm. that like, all policies are, well, let's say fast mixing. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering. So because because at some point you say that uh, that uh, that you can show okay. that uh, slow huh? mixing you want the lower bound yeah right I mean I mean from the perspective of the lower uniform bound, slow yeah mixing. but it's, yeah. it's it's uniform yeah. right right so so like uh, so like all the all the mixing times for all the policies are the same right yes so um I guess I'm just wondering is this really a necessary condition so for example if I know that oh. my optimal policy, for example, is fast mixing, right? Can I get better performance? Can I go beyond these lower bands? Have you been thinking about this at all? So in particular, is this uniform mixing condition really necessary? Diameter. Yeah, Span like a diameter. Span of the value function, yeah. of the optimal value function. There are all yeah, these so like, values, uh, can, right? can you replace that, for example, with the scale of the optimal value? I think in terms of lower bound, I, I think maybe the, I see. I, I think that's like, more like an upper bound question though, right? Yeah, I feel like for the lower yeah, bound, yeah, yeah. you need to at least show some dependence, at least on the average of the, like for, for example, in terms of the lower bound, you can think of like, you have a optimal policy that mixes really fast, but like, you are hiding that policy among all those like uh, policies that makes it really slow and you need to select uh, this best policy, but because it is hiding among the policies that makes it really slow, then you are easily trapped into the uh, policies that makes it really slow. So like, it feels like it will more like depending on the uh, average or May even the worst like mixing time of the all policies that you are going to look at. In terms of upper bound, I agree. In terms of upper bound, it is okay. I guess for our particular technique, I think it is. So I think the interesting thing, the most interesting thing between the difference of like average reward MDP and discounted MDP is that like. For discounted MDP, the convergence is manually made because all the infinite series you're considering is gamma discounted. So there is a uniform like uh, converging quality of all the policies. And the interesting thing about average reward MDP is that the uh, quality of like how well these uh, state rewards converge to the actual reward of the game 
depend on how fast each of these policies mix. And that can easily vary from policy to policy because of the nature of the definition of average reward MVP. So I think I think Chaba also asked me this question when I first presented the first half of this talk in ICML. And I have been trying to think a bit about how to get improved like mixing time dependence. Like suppose we have a good uh, mixing time for the optimal policy. Can we hope to like constrain, like make the domain smaller and to formulate the problem and argue that we are actually, like we don't actually need to look at the policies that mix it so slow. I feel like a natural, I feel like a natural first step that I was stuck. I couldn't make these kinds of methods work is because that I don't know how to, I don't know about the continuity of mixing time in terms of policy. Like if suppose I'm having a probability transition that mixes really well, and suppose I have a probability transition that doesn't mix so well, I don't know how, I don't know how to argue that like uh, there, right, when yeah, yeah. I'm considering the continuum of this probability transition. There, there's some other. really nice perturbation results in, in matrix theory for this, like specifically for Markov chain perturbation uh, and sensitivity. And, and I think that there are even results maybe for mixing time like the sensitivity oh. of the mixing time on the transition like the probability, yeah. much more refined. It's oh, like, it's like fine, you know, I, the spectrum of the matrix, like how it plays at all. And it's not just a spectral gap, but like really like there is a fundamental matrix that describes like how these things are working. And yeah. Oh, that would be very interesting. Yeah, I think- I'm not sure, I, I, I wouldn't know how to use it, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, okay, so another idea I think I've explored a little bit is try to argue that, so we have average reward MDP, so we can consider like a regularized MDP that we somehow like modify it a little bit to have the mixing time a little bit better. And then we have a crew solution and we do like an iterative process to say that we consider a regularized mixing time that is more well conditioned and then we get a crew solution. And then using that, starting from that crew solution, we consider a less regularized MDP. So it, it's like similar idea to like the acceleration in complex um, optimization. That's also it's... one thing I have tried a little bit mm -hmm. to improve the average reward dependence. I feel these methods all have like similar in some sense issues in the sense that essentially I feel the problem is that the stationary distribution is not continuous in terms of the probability transition changes. So the worry is that if in some extreme cases, if the probability transition only changes a little bit, the stationary distribution can change a lot. So it's really a discontinuous function and then it will completely change the average reward value of the of the markup decision process. Like uh -huh. there really might be some like ideas like that in the things I was talking about. And maybe you guys also mentioned about that can make this work and have better performance. Like these are just some like things that I have tried and I didn't manage to make it work, but maybe it's like, yeah, maybe I don't understand mm -hmm. matrix theory well enough or whatever yeah but so, so, so what i was what i was thinking about is that uh, well if you just consider running like ucrl or like a regret minimization algorithm that gets guarantees that depend on the diameter of the mdp which is something a lot smaller than the mixing time right because Sometimes. it only only needs the optimal policy to mix fast right so if you want to go fast in the mdp then you can go fast and you can get a, a lower diameter that's right you could take the mixture policy or extract somehow the, the best policy that UCRL was discovering. And yeah, yeah you so could get a guarantee for this setting for, from the UCRL proof. Um, and, and it would depend on the diameter. By the way, uh, can I ask a question before, Gergu? 
comes back because it, it's related to to all of this. I think that we are discussing this mixing time. The ergotum seems to rely on the fact that we know the mixing time, and yes. I'm sure that you were thinking about how to extend it so that this knowledge is not not required, or is this really essential? Can you prove that? If you have no idea about the mixing time and all, then all bets are off, and there are no good ergotums. Or, I guess that's that that is not true. Like UCR yeah, doesn't need not. to know the diameter, and it's happily computing everything. It knows that the diameter is finite, so that that's the thing. But like, okay, given that the diameter is finite, it has a uniform guarantee for all the MDPs. I think this is a great question. I yeah, I think there is I I I didn't verify it for formally, but I believe we can make a variant of this algorithm that we do not need to know the mixing time parameter. I feel like a natural way of doing this, a possible idea is that we can do like essentially like a binary search thing and then like try to uh, dynamically guess the actual mixing time of our of our algorithm. So it's basically you start you start with a guess for the mixing time, and then you do your computation, and then you check whether uh, the value function is at the boundary of the space, and then if so, then you increase, and if not, then you stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think the idea is that we start from like, for example, mixing time one, and every time we multiply the range where, and we, we multiply this quantity and uh, do the computation under this assumed mixing time bound. And what we are going to do is that we are going to check the quality. So we can estimate the value under a policy uh, to like epsilon accuracy when like, in like T mix SA over epsilon squared times, right? So yeah, we can yeah, yeah. estimate it iteratively, and as long as when we are multiplying the mixing time and right. the quality of the value doesn't improve, then we can stop. Uh, I see. Uh, that I think will lose a log T mix factor. Well, that will lose log. T -mix that looks factor. fine. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Because we already have a log T mix. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm not really sure because uh, yeah, 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 you're right, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's a geometric sequence. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that yeah, like verifying, like certifying whether the solution, like you compute a solution that predicts how much value you will get, you verify it, it can be done very quickly. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, Gerger, or anyone else. I, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm very happy. Thanks. Yeah, it it was a very nice talk. Thank so you. Could, uh, yeah, it, it's my great pleasure. It's it's a lot of nice questions. Oh, by the way, we are we are currently working on trying to get the high sample complexity here, but I I, I feel like we are following more like a stat statistical approach and not an algorithmic approach. So everyone has nice ideas in improving the algorithm you propose for the problem, that is very welcome. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. All right. See you everyone next week. Yep. See you. Thank you for the great question. Thank See you. Thank you for Bye. all. Yep. See you. Thanks for yeah. a great talk. Bye. Thank you.